my name is Peter Duben and I am going to talk about machine learning. Unfortunately, our holiday plans have shifted slightly. So originally the plan was to be um, virtually present but live and now the plan is to be virtually present um, but recorded. But um, at least I'm going to, to try very hard to be available for a question and answer session that we will have after this recorded um, presentation. So please, whatever you do, um, if you listen to the presentation, uh, keep track of all the questions that you have because I'm going to try to answer them virtual but live after the presentation. So I'm um, the machine learning coordinator at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Predictions. And before I go into detail to talk about machine learning, I thought it would probably be a good idea to talk about um, what we do um, at ECNWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Predictions. So this is just one slide. Uh, however, it's not very detailed because you're going to have um, way more information later on about these WF um, after this machine learning session and also you're going to actually get a tour through the computing hall and all, all of these kind of things so there's no reason for me to kind of go into a lot of details however for this talk you need to know what we do and what we do is um, we do operational weather predictions and in particular we're focusing on what we call the medium range so we're looking a couple of um, a couple of days all the way to seasons into the future and um, we do this by basically um, pro providing a global weather prediction model and then doing 24-7 um, operational weather service, meaning that we run our, our weather prediction model on supercomputers. And therefore, um, we have an HPC application. And therefore, I guess it's, um, it's, uh, that was one of the reasons why I was invited to talk about um, uh, to talk at the summer school here. We are based in Reading, which is close to London, but we now also have two more sites. One of them is in Bologna and one of them is in Bonn. So we're kind of now spreading a little bit more over Europe. So now let's come to machine learning as such. Uh, there are three things that are often discussed in the media and uh, with all sorts of different people and persons. Um, one of them is artificial intelligence, one of them is machine learning, and one of them is deep learning. And I just wanted to start this um, presentation by basically just providing you a couple of definitions of what we're actually talking about when we when we, we talk about both things. So artificial intelligence, if you just open Wikipedia, you will see that artificial intelligence is intelligence demonstrated by machines in contrast to the natural intelligence displaced by human, um, humans. So what this actually means is, if I want to, to build a self-driving car, I can do this. But then if there's a, a bike basically appearing in front of the car, the car needs to make a couple of decisions and should better brake. So it would, should better kind of make the same decision that a normal driver, a human in this, in this case, would actually do. And therefore, it's, it's basically behaving human-like, and therefore, it's what we call artificial intelligence. And now there's a subclass to artificial intelligence, which is called machine learning. <coughs> so machine learning is... Um, basically the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit ins instructions. What does this mean? Basically it's um, the way how the, the, the car would realize that there's a cycling in front of it. So basically it is how to learn to distinguish between, for example, a cyclist and um, the normal road without a cyclist. So basically it would need to be able to detect the cyclist. And that's what we do with machine learning. And basically, the, the real idea is that you don't really provide it with a lot of details. So you don't really um, say say the, machi the machine that there's a bike and you should look in, out for, for two wheels separated by 1.2 meters or something like this. But you rather just let it learn how to detect the cycling. Let's give you samples of how cyclists typically look like. And then also um, there's deep learning. And deep learning is part of a broader family of machine learning methods based on artificial neural networks. So that's now a very specific method. So that's a very specific method how to detect this cyclist. If you, for example, have a video streams of the surroundings, deep learning would actually be a, a specific tool that would enable you to detect the cyclist. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's go into a bit more detail about deep learning because it's quite important nowadays. So deep learning is what we would we call um, the use of artificial neural networks. And um, it's basically one, one example of machine learning. It's not only, as I said, the deep learning is a subclass of machine learning, but it's a very important one. And what you do here is in principle <coughs> that you have a lot of data. So you have um, input data on the left and you have output data on the right. And then you try to learn this mapping from input data to output data. And you basically have a network 
which is very much looking like a like the neurons of a brain so it resembles to a large extent what we what, how the brain brain is working and the brain is working with a lot of different neurons um like the red ones in here that are interconnected and typically the neural networks basically information is flowing from the input layer to um what we call hidden layers so layers that are interconnected um, to the, the the front and the and the and the, and the back and then the information flows through it and then there's an output layer where the output comes out and um, when you basically train a neural network what you do is you kind of um, change the different the, the strength of the different connectivities within the neural network so you basically learn how how strongly the different neurons are connected and that's very similar to what how it works in the brain so the concept is that we take a lot of input and a lot of output samples um, from a very large data set and then we basically learn to predict the outputs from the inputs and once you've done this um, from very, a lot of samples, you can actually predict output from unseen inputs. And that's the magic. Then you can basically just take any, any odd input that kind of any odd video streams from a car, for example, and you should be able to detect, for example, where the output is. <clears throat> and the key here is that the neural network is basically used as a black box. So it doesn't really matter um, what you learn. So you can learn all sorts of different things. You can learn to distinguish a, a bike from a melon or a cat from a dog, but you can also um, learn how to progress, for example, physical fields, and you can use physical fields as inputs. You can learn to play Go or whatever. Um, it's very, very, a lot of different different ways how to, to use this, this neural network and how to learn it, but it's used as a black box. So you're not going to understand in detail what the neural network is actually doing. It's just something that you, 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 you train from the data set and then you hope that it's getting the idea. Um, but on the plus side, basically no previous knowledge about the system is really required. So you can do this for, for whatever, even if you don't have a theory, you can just basically learn, try to learn the system um, behind it. And um, one of the important things is also that the more data you will have, the better the solution is going to be. So that's important. This basically means that um, you, can, you can learn whatever system of complexity you have, um, but you need to have enough data to basically um, to, to learn all the different properties. And the more data you have, the more complex you can make the network. So if you have more data, you can add more hidden layers. So more layers in the, in, between input and output layers into the mix. You can ha in introduce more neurons and so on and so forth. So there's no limit. And that's also very important here. Um, you can basically increase complexity as much as you want, and you will still gain something as long as you have enough data. This is a very, very versatile tool, and it's basically used now in a lot of different application areas. Um, image recognition, speak recognition, healthcare, gaming, finance, music competition and arts, and what, what not, you name it. Um, and you, you, you open your newspaper and you will probably find another uh, application for machine learning somewhere. And the question for this talk, to some extent, is whether we can also use this for weather and climate prediction. So can we actually use this facility also to, um, to predict the weather? Just um, just one example, which is kind of um, a good counter example, if you want, um, that machine learning is not just deep learning. Um, there's also tools which are called decision trees or random forest, and they are also quite important. Um, I, I, I won't go into much detail, but I just wanted to make you aware that there are other things as well. So what you do in decision trees is basically you take a lot of data and then you kind of formulate a tree structure. And you say, for example, from all the cases here, um, uh, this is for this is for a prediction of um, ensemble predictions for um, total precipitations, and you basically learn how to predict the, the, the probability distributions of precipitation given some sort of large scale features. And um, if you kind of take in all cases, and yet then you basically look for those cases with a um, cloud fraction of 75%, then you kind of follow this branch here. And if you then have a total precipitation, which is between two and eight millimeters, you follow this branch and so on and so forth. And it's basically like a big lookup table. And you follow the different branches of the trees, and in the end, you basically get a mapping function where the precip and precipitation will fall out. This is from, from the tool called um, Easy Point, which was developed by Tim Eusen and Fatima Pilosu at Eastern WF. It's basically like literally, literally like a tree that you go uh, uh, um, uh, along those trunks. So the decision forks into tree structures until a prediction is made. And now you can not only just train one of those trees, you can actually train a very large number of trees, and then you have a forest, and therefore, um, there's a technique which is called random forests and there you basically kind of follow on different tree structures that you've learned that are also all slightly different um, but by following down the different trees you will get a lot of answers and this will basically help you to also understand the uncertainty of a prediction so basically by getting 50 different answers that are slightly different you will also be able to judge the uncertainty of the of the decision but you can also for example go for the mean decision that is taken by all those trees and get a better results and by just using one a single tree 
Um, decision trees are often very fast and accurate, um, and they are able to conserve some of the properties of the system. However, um, they often require a lot of memory and are and therefore often also, also then expensive on HPC systems. Um, basically, it's a, it's a very efficient way to kind of formulate a lookup table. Okay, this is just to give you an overview about machine learning principle. Um, and I've stolen this figure from somewhere on the internet. Basically, um, this is to show you that there are two big classes of machine learning. Um, one of them is what we call supervised learning, and it's on the left here. And what you do there is um, this idea of having out input and output fields, and then you basically train from um, train a mapping procedure from input and output fields. And this can be, for example, a classification. For example, it can basically be um, try to divide socks into colors, or it could be a question whether it's a cat or a dog in the picture and all these kind of things. But it can also be a regression, and regression would basically be something which is like a continuous number. It could, for example, be how much is it going to rain tomorrow, how many millimeters per six hours or something like this. And on the other hand, there's a, a whole other family of methods, um, which is called unsupervised learning. And what you do here is you provide a lot of data, and then you use a machine to basically um, learn th some properties about the data. So it could, for example, be things like clustering techniques that you try to understand um, certain clusters within the data. You can do association, you can do dimensionality reduction. For example, if you take a lot of data and then you calculate uh, the leading EUFs, for example, so the leading modes of variability of the system, then you can try to represent the, the vast amount of data by just a couple of degrees of freedoms by, by focusing on the, on the, the leading most modes of variability. So there are a lot of ways to reduce dimensionality of large data sets as well. At the moment, most of the different studies that are performed are, are happening in supervised learning on the left here. However, this doesn't mean at all that there's nothing to gain in unsupervised learning. It's just that we basically, um, I guess most of the groups start with supervised learning and probably will switch at one point also to unsupervised learning. So there's more to gain, but I'm going to focus also more on the, on the left side and the supervised learning in this talk, just because at the moment, a lot of prominent techniques are developed there. Okay, um, so the big question, why would you actually be interested to do machine learning and why in, in the weather and climate prediction side? So why would it actually help you to do something like this? And I like to show a, a picture of the Earth system at this stage, just to figure out like, why is it actually so difficult to make a prediction of future weather and climate? And basically there are a couple of reasons. One of them is that the world is quite a big thing. Um, so this means basically I can formulate models that, that basically predict what the Earth is going to do and the atmosphere and the ocean, but um, I will only be able to kind of go, go um, to a specific resolution of the models because I can't afford to run very, very high resolution simulations um, given the size of the Earth. And this basically means that a lot of properties of the Earth system, like for example, individual clouds are not going to be resolved. And that's a problem because individual clouds, as you all know, are quite important if you want to get, know whether you will get wet or not. Um, so they're basically a, a very important features that can't be resolved and they need to be represented via so-called parameterization schemes. And this is basically something like you try to represent something which you cannot represent on a given grid by using the information on a given grid. And that's intrinsically uncertain. So there's a lot of uncertainty coming in here. Also, the Earth system is actually a turbulent system. So you can see, for example, some filamentation going on here in the flow. And this is a clear sign that you have scale interactions. And this is a clear sign that you have exponential growth and growth of, of errors. And if, you, if your initial conditions are not 100% not correct, which they never will be in the Earth system, even if you had the perfect model. And finally, the also the Earth is very complex. So you have atmosphere, ocean, land surface, sea ice, land ice, um, atmospheric chemistry, all working together with each other and interacting on different time scales and non-linearly. Non and it's, it's very difficult to, to represent such a, a huge complex system in, in, a, in a numerical model. And therefore we basically build models that have a million lines of code and they're very complex and this comes with all sorts of problems. So it's just tricky to kind of predict um, weather and climate. However, on the plus side is um, that we have a huge amount of observations um, about the Earth system. So we are collecting something like hundreds of millions of observations uh, at Eastern Abbey every day. And um, also um, we have a lot of model data, model output data from the past um, from which we can learn a lot about the properties of the Earth system. So there's a lot of data available, actually hundreds of petabytes. And that's a plus side. And if you now combine those two points that you basically have a system which is very difficult to predict, um, where you don't know all the different, different, all the equations for all the properties, 
Um, it's very complex. And on the other hand, you have a lot of data available. And it, it kind of directly makes, it's clear that, that, this, that, that, that a tool that could learn a lot of information from data could be very useful um, to make predictions. And this tool is actually machine learning. And machine learning is not only um, very good to learn something from data, but it's also very efficient in terms of numerics. It can actually also make very fast, um, can, can be used to make very fast and efficient compute models. And therefore, even if you're not interested in machine learning just for the sake of learning from data, you should still be interested in machine learning if you think about high performance computing applications, for example. So the next question, um, why is machine learning so hip at the moment? Why is everyone talking about machine learning? <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that actually the amount of data that we have stored about the Earth system is growing exponentially. I, I told you just um, the, before, but this is just a figure to, to visualize this. So on the x-axis of this figure, you basically have the different years um, over the last couple of decades. On the y-axis, you have the sustained peak performance of the different computers that we were using. And the different boxes are the different computers that we used at the time. And you see that the linear increase over, over time here, um, and it's a logarithmic scale. So that this basically means there has been an exponential increase in compute power over time. But there's also this blue line in the, in the figure. And the blue line is actually the growth of the data archive. And what you see here is that it's again a linear line in the figure and this basically means there has been an exponential growth in the amount of data that we use at ESNWF over time and this is just yeah an amazing resource that you can can learn something from and therefore that's one of the reasons why machine learning is so in at the moment because we have a lot of data on all sorts of different domains the second question uh, the second reason is that there is a lot of supercomputing hardware at the moment developed towards machine learning so this is a slide that i've stolen from Thorsten Höfler and he tried to basically kind of name all the different companies that do something in the development of hardware for machine learning. And you will see that there are many of them and actually the, the number is still growing. So um, the high performance computing hardware is a multi-billion dollar industry and supercomputing um, itself is, is actually um, a smaller market if you want. Um, and therefore this basically means that the supercomputing hardware is dwarfed at the moment by developments to for, towards machine learning. And this means that even if you're not interested in machine learning per se, you should still think about the use of machine learning hardware for your different applications. The next one is machine learning software. <clears throat> so actually it turns out that um, there are a lot of very, very good software libraries available for, um, that you can use to do machine learning. And they basically allow you to, um, to build very complex machine learning tools just from a couple of hundred lines of Python code. And that's great for development. So even if you don't know much about machine learning, um, per se, um, you can easily use this, this software to really m build quite powerful machine learning tools already. And this also really helps progress quite a lot. And the last one point is the increase in knowledge. So there is something like 100 papers on machine learning coming out every day. And this basically means that you are, um, that, that you are able to kind of build much more customized machine learning solutions for your specific applications nowadays than you were like five years ago. And this means that you also can build more powerful tools. And here we go, here's a wave of machine learning splashing into our domains. Um, why is the timing also quite interesting for weather and climate sciences? Um, one of them, the reasons is because there is a big project coming up, which is called Destination Earth. And in Destination Earth, the idea is to build what we call digital twins of the Earth. So we basically build a digital replica of the Earth system by basically running very, very high resolution data simulation cycles and using very, very high resolution models. And um, this comes along with a lot of detail in our representation, but also with an enormous amount of data. And again, if you want to really make the best use of this data, you probably want to look into machine learning as well. And just to give you a flavor of this, um, I've shown you this figure before here, but I haven't told you back then that one, one half of the figure is basically a model simulation and the other half is an observation. So we are already at a stage that a really, really high resolution simulation is hard to, hard to distinguish um, from an observational field. So it's, it's, it's really that we are, that, that our models are actually um, quite good in representing the Earth system and can be, um, can it be assumed to be something like a digital twin as well. And the second reason is why machine learning could also be very important, um, that there is what we call a digital revolution of Earth system sciences at the moment. So I, I believe in this, this the summer school here, you will also learn a lot about the problems that we have with high performance computing and big data at the moment and how difficult it is to tackle um, this, the, the complexity of heterogeneous hardware, for example, and the amount of data and actually also how um, 
and what, what, what tools we're, we're going to develop there. And to some extent, if you really want to make the best use of, of the future supercomputers, you probably have to rewrite and uh, rethink about the way that you actually do modeling. So you have to think about using domain specific languages that I'm sure you will talk about. And um, you also have to think about going away from Fortran um, language into something kind of more high level, like for example, Python or Jupyter Notebooks or something like this. And um, there in this development, basically machine learning fits in quite, um, quite well. So I've, I've stolen this figure from the paper and basically what I want to make you aware of that one of the four main most important contributions to from the digital revolution, one of them is actually machine learning. So there's more to come in this front as well. Okay, um, so the big and most important questions of all, I have shown this slide probably a hundred times already, but I, I'm not getting, um, I'm, I'm still going to repeat this because I think, I think this really illustrates quite well where we are with machine learning at the moment. So the big question is, what will machine learning look like in 10 years from now? What will we do with machine learning in our system sciences? And a lot of very smart people will tell you that we're going to be on the left side of the scale. Um, and on the left side, the opinion is that machine learning will have no long-term effect whatsoever. It's just a way of passing by and we're going to go back to business as usual in 10 years. And then we're going to talk about quantum computing or whatnot, but not much more about machine learning. And on the right side of the scale, basically, um, we argue that machine learning will replace conventional models more or less entirely and that we're not going to do anything conven conventional anymore, but we will just learn everything from data. And a lot of smart people will tell you that we are on the right side here. And this is a gray scale because there are some applications where it's more obvious that machine learning will replace um, the business as usual. And there are some um, applications where it's kind of much more unlikely that actually machine learning will be competitive with conventional tools. And the question is, where are we? And it's still true, I'm presenting this slide now for two years, but it's still true that we don't really know. Um, the uncertainty range is kind of still quite significant and we're not quite sure where we're going to end up on the scale. Let's just assume that we're going to be on the very right side of the scale. Let's just assume we're going to be here. So what would this world look like? Um, and we've done a study um, two years ago now, two and a half years, um, where we basically try to build an entire um, weather prediction system on, based on machine learning using no conventional um, knowledge whatsoever. So um, you can do this. And I told you before about all the limitations that we have when performing um, weather and climate predictions. And um, I also told you that we have this enormous amount of data. So why not? Why not just try and see what, how far we can get? And that what, that's what we've done here. What we've done is we have retrieved data for what we call geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. So it's a, a two-dimensional field on the globe. And we have information about how this field looked like in the last couple of decades um, by looking into what we call um, era five reanalysis data. So we have a, a global field. We know how it looked like over the last couple of decades and we have it in hourly resolution. <clears throat> and now we take this field and map it to a very coarse resolution grid. And now we basically kind of um, produce a stencil of grid points in, in the, within this grid, takes this information and try to predict what the, 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 the point in the middle will look like in one hour from now. And once we've done, we've learned this using deep learning, we can actually kind of just um, stream this, this stencil through the grid and we can update all the points. And here we go. We have a prediction system. We can actually update the grid one hour at the time, looking more and more into the future. And then we can basically make a prediction. And you don't need any physical understanding for this whatsoever. It doesn't really matter. You just you just do it based on the on the data. And these are videos of how the fields look like, and I hope that they come out in this virtual talk. But what you see is on one side there is um, the truth, so how the, the the field evolved over time in the truth earth system, and then on the other hand you basically see how the field evolved over time in the machine learning tool. And what you would, should see is that they are evolving very similarly. So even domain scientists couldn't tell you which one is the truth and which one is um, the machine learning model. So basically um, the neural network is doing very well and take, picking up the dynamics. So that's good news. That's cool. Um, and, and also if you calculate forecast errors now, so you have a prediction model, so you can calculate forecast errors. You actually also get quite good results. So you, um, on, on the on the plot on the right, you basically have um, time in hours on the x-axis for a five-day prediction, and you have the L1 error and forecast error for geopotential height on the y-axis. And the black line here is what the neural network um, spits out. So there's a significant error, no question, but the tool only has something like two and a half thousand degrees of freedoms, so it's not very big. 
And if you take a very, 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 very old dynamical model, the conventional tool, you will get the blue line in here. And those two lines are kind of comparable in terms of complexity and effort. And what you should see is that they are not too far away from each other. So for just me kind of being um, ignorant and just trying out neural networks for whether predictions actually resulted in some, some quite good result. It's far away from what we have in operational predictions. That's the magenta line down here. So it's not that it's anywhere close to um, reasonable operational forecast, but this line down here is based on a billion degrees of freedom. It's not 2,500. So we're actually not doing so bad. And there have been a lot of there's been a lot of progress in this um, in this area, and a lot of papers are coming out, and, and they show how to to really do it, not not like the stupid way that we did it. And those papers kind of use much better training data sets, they use much better neural networks, and they brought down this black line quite significantly. So actually, those tools getting better and better. So is this going to be the future? Are we going to make medium weather medium range weather predictions a couple of days into the future, just based on on deep learning in the future? And I would say the answer is clearly not. Um, a couple of reasons, and um, one of them is <clears throat> that. Um, so, I've I've show I'll show you here videos of how the the field is progressing in time, but I haven't told you yet um, that if I run this model a couple of months into the future, it will it will just diverge. It will the the system will explode at one point. It will um, produce unreasonable results um, long into the future. So it's actually not quite there that it's kind of really a very realistic representation of the three-dimensional atmosphere. Um, and that's kind of quite intuitive because I haven't told the system anything about conservation properties and so on and so forth. So it's still quite a quite a, roof, uh, quite a, quite a rough representation of the Earth. And it's also unknown how to increase complexity and how to fix feature interactions, for example. So if I wanted to build a model with a billion degrees of freedoms, like the magenta line down here, um, that's actually not very simple to do, and um, I wouldn't know yet how to do it. So um, we're not quite there. And also, I told you that we have hundreds of petabytes of data, but we only have something like 40 years of satellite observations. So the amount of different weather situations that you can actually train from is actually limited, and it's probably not enough to, to train a model which has a billion of de degrees of freedom. So there are a lot of reasons for skepticism here. However, um, this doesn't mean that these tools are not useful for um, anything. Uh, this is just basically to say it's also very difficult to beat um, current weather and climate models because they're just so amazing. And it's again basically a figure here about cloud structures over Indonesia from a high resolution simulation on the one side and an observation on the other. And you can't tell really which one is a model and which one is the observations. So these tools are really amazing and it's very difficult to beat them. But there are things. Um, where you can actually think that, where you can actually assume that machine learning is going to to beat um, conventional tools, and one of them is if you think about um, very short-term predictions. So there's a group um, from Google um, where they built the so-called MetNet tool, where they basically look into um, weather predictions a couple of hours into the future for precipitation over Seattle in this case, and you have the ground truth in the middle, and you have the machine learning tool on the right. And you have the conventional tool on the left. And what you should see is that the middle and the right are much more similar, which means that the machine learning tool is probably better here um, already than the, the, the conventional tool. And also, if you think about very long-term predictions, um, the predictions can become more like a statistical problem rather than actually a representation of the atmosphere at a certain time in three dimensions. And then there's a paper, for example, by Hamid Al, where they show that for multi-year ENSO predictions, so predictions multi-years into the future, actually machine learning can do a great job to kind of improve the quality of predictions. So um, for very short-term predictions and for very long-term predictions, machine learning may actually have a much better chance to be conventional tools. And the big question is, what happens about climate? Because climate is a bit, um, a bit tricky, because if you train a specific tool on nowadays climate and the climate is changing, what does it actually mean? So can you trust a model that has been trained on today's data if, for example, Arctic sea ice is just disappearing? Because um, you trained the model for a specific data set, and if the, the situation is kind of outside of this data set, you'd have no idea what the machine learning tool is actually going to be doing. That's what we call extrapolation. Um, and machine learning tools are typically very, very good in interpolation. So it kind of represents something that happens within the range of the training data set, but they're quite bad often in extrapolation. For example, deep learning in particular is quite bad in this. And for climate, we will probably have to extrapolate. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen. If you don't know, if you don't want to go all in and you don't want to kind of just um, 
represent the entire Earth system with, with deep learning, for example. You can still do a lot of very useful stuff. And um, I asked around at Eastern WF and asked for different application areas. And what this plot is showing here is the um, operational workflow that we have at Eastern WF. So we collect observations, then we have data simulation that is combining the observations with the forecast model. Then we perform a numerical weather forecast to look into the future. And then we have post-processing and dissemination where we basically kind of um, extract the relevant information from the data and um, let it go and um, bring it to the end users, bring it to your mobile phone um, that you can make use of it. And I've asked around where people think that machine learning could make a difference in principle. And people came up with a lot of different answers that are basically represented in those boxes here. Um, and you will see that the color coding of the boxes is the same as the color coding of the, um, of the different workflow tools. And basically what, I, what you should realize here is um, that there are a lot of potential application areas for machine learning and that they're distributed all over the, the, the workflow of numerical weather predictions and climate predictions. And this also, this includes observation, data simulation, numerical weather forecast, post-processing, but also in particular also the high performance computing and the big data processing infrastructure, which is kind of relevant for all of those different boxes in the workflow. And now is the time to actually try to realize for which of those applications machine learning will make a significant difference and for which of those applications um, machine learning will not be able to beat conventional tools. So that's really up for now, um, our task to, do, to investigate. And what I will do in the next couple of slides is um, that I will give you a couple of examples um, where we want to use machine learning or are using machine learning already and um, to give you an impression of what can be done. Let's start with the data, uh, in particular data simulation. <clears throat> and I've told you before that what we do in data simulation is that you take observations and you take a model trajectory of the past, uh, the blue line in here, and then you have an assimilation window, a couple of like a time, um, a time series of something like 12 hours, and then you run a big minimization process to try to kind of push the blue trajectory towards the observations and then get a new trajectory, which is basically very close to the observations, but still representing a very useful um, well, a useful representation of a weather system as it would be represented within the model. And then this representation, you, you basically at the end of the, the um, at this simulation window, you make a, a cut, and then you can use this state as an initial, initial condition for your prediction into the future. So data simulation basically combines a model and observations and generates initial conditions to make predictions. Okay, so um, during data simulation, you have observations and the model very close together, and you actually have it so close together that you could potentially try to understand the errors that the model is doing within this observation window and um, based on the difference to the observations. So you can literally directly diagnose the model error within the data simulation window. And um, you can do this by do two different things. Either you can run a very complex data simulation framework, this 40 var framework that we use at Eastern WF, and use a fairly kind of fairly, um, well, fa fairly non-complex machine learning solution. And then we have a, a tool called Reconstraint 40 var And that's something that Patrick and Massimo have looked into a lot at Eastern WF. Or on the other hand, you can also just run the model forward, um, have your observations close by, and you can basically just diagnose the error that you have um, at the end of the assimilation window in comparison to the observation. And once you've diagnosed the error and you have the state of the atmosphere, you can actually learn a prediction a mapping from the state of the atmosphere to the uh, to the error that you have diagnosed. And there you can use all sorts of complex machine learning tools like deep neural networks. The benefit is um, that once you have learned the bias, you can actually um, use this to correct for the bias within the data simulation and, gen uh, and, and produce better initial conditions, but you can also correct for the bias in forecast simulations in principle at least. Um, and also, once you have a representation of the error, you can also try to learn and understand the properties of the error, meaning that you can try to understand what's going wrong. And that's also very interesting. And here are some plots um, that show um, results from a collaboration with NVIDIA, where we looked into basically this idea. You provide um, input data as a three-dimensional state of the atmosphere for temperature, and then you have output data, which is basically the bias, the error that you get in the temperature prediction. And then we try to kind of correct for the, the temperature error within data simulation. And what you see here is on the left, you see a cross-section through the atmosphere um, in model levels and longitude. And on the right, you see what the neural network is predicting. And what you should see is that the features are very similar. So we actually get quite good results in terms of the neural network is learning really how to represent the error. And we now we get really curious to kind of put it back into the data simulation system and see how it goes. 
Okay, um, the next one is what we call the emulation of parameterization schemes. And what you do here is you basically run your forecast model into the future, and then you store input and output data pairs um, of a specific component, in this case, a so-called parameterization scheme. And then you basically use this data to train a neural network. So you, you, you train a neural network to basically just learn the mapping from inputs to output data. And once you've done this and the neural network is reasonably good, then you can actually replace the parameterization scheme, so the expensive parts, by the neural network within the model. Why would you do this? <clears throat> basically, it's very likely that the neural network is going to be much more efficient and more portable to all sorts of different hardware in comparison to the conventional tool. So you do it because you want to gain efficiency. And this is a very active area of research. Here are a couple of um, citations, but there are many more. Um, where people try to kind of do this emulation step within um, for specific components of the weather and climate models. And we have also done our bit, um, in particular Matthew Chantry and Sam Hatfield have looked into the emulation of non-orographic gravity wave track. And Sam is going to give you the introduction to ESNWF later on. So you will see his face, I guess, at least virtually um, today. Um, and so basically the non-orographic gravity wave track is basically um, the, the, the interactions between like um, the, the, the roughness of the surface, for example, and also, um, for example, convective, um, convective plumes with kind of um, wind patterns, and then you have shear, and then you basically generate waves um, that propagate all the way through the atmosphere. And they are um, often too, too small to be resolved, and therefore we have a permutation scheme for it. And now, um, after a lot of work, we basically found a very nice relationship between the neural network complexity and the error reduction. So basically, the more data we give the problem um, and give to the learning process, we, the, the less the error is going to be for our neural network application. We found that um, we get something like a factor of 10 faster emulators when compared to the original scheme if you um, assume that your emulator is going to run a, on a GPU because their machine learning um, tools are very efficient. And also we could generate what we call a linear and a joint model code from the emulator, which is very useful for our 40 var data simulation framework. So there's also other benefits um, from those emulators. And finally, we could actually achieve better results when using the emulator when compared to conventional or the default um, scheme that we're using, just for the simple reason that our training data was using a very high fidelity um, version of this gravity wave track scheme. So we actually used a um, a, a reference truth that was better than our default version of operations, and therefore we could reduce the forecast error and not increase. So there's a lot of interest and in think science in here, and a lot um, that can still be done to kind of learn more about this. <coughs> um, you can also just think about learning things that you can't really afford to run in operations. So, for example, in our radiation scheme, where you basically take um, radiation from the sun coming into the earth, interacting with clouds. A little bit is reflected, something goes through um, to the surface, and then you have long wave radiation from the surface, again, interacting with the atmosphere and clouds. Some, some of it goes through into the space, and some goes down again to the Earth. And there's a, uh, the radiation scheme is basically taking care of this radiation. <coughs> and we have two different versions here. One of them is called triple clouds. And in the triple clouds, you basically just assume that you have a column of, of um, the atmosphere, and the clouds are just shallow layers. And then there's um, one part, which is called Spartacus, where you can take three-dimensional shapes of the clouds into account. But it's really expensive to do this. It's actually too expensive for us to use this in operations. And the question is now whether we can emulate the difference between triple clouds and Spartacus. And this is something that David Meyer from the University of Reading looked into. And the answer is, yeah, you can actually do this quite well. Um, so you, you, get, you can represent heating rates, for example. On the left, you have the truth. Uh, you have a longitude section through the atmosphere here. And you have um, the, 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 the heat wave from, um, from long wave on the top and the heat, heating rate from short wave on the bottom. So how much the atmosphere actually was heating up and for the different levels of the atmosphere and the, and the y axis. And on the, on the left side, you see the difference of Spartacus and triple clouds in the truth. And on the right side, you see the difference that you get from uh, your neural network emulator. So it, actually, it is actually working. It's, it's um, doing uh, quite well. And the cost is really um, quite significant, the cost reduction. So Spartacus itself is more than four times more expensive than the triple cloud server would be if it's normalized to one. And the neural network basically comes for free. So that's maybe a way that we can add complexity into our system, um, increase physical representation of the system in terms of three-dimensional cloud shapes uh, with almost no ex additional cost. And that's something that we should look into more in the future. 
<clears throat> then there's also things like um, linear solvers. So for grid point models, you typically require um, semi-implicit time stepping schemes that basically allow you to make to perform very large time steps. But then you need uh, what we call a linear solver to, large, to solve a very large linear system. And by doing this, um, you, 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 you're using very large time steps, but also this linear solver step is extremely expensive. Um, and the question was whether we can actually use machine learning to kind of precondition this linear solver. So to basically get this linear solver to converge much, much faster to um, a good solution of the system. And the answer is, it's actually working quite well. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, Jan Ackmann from the University of Oxford looked into this and we're actually getting quite nice results in terms of that we can reduce the amount of iterations that the linear solver will require by using machine learning to kind of predict what the time step could look like. Also post-processing, <clears throat> so this is now work that we've done in collaboration with the, with the group of Thorsten Höfler from ETH. And what you do here is basically after the forecast has finished, you look into the data that comes out of the model and you try to improve predictions a little bit further. And in particular, um, at least in WF, we're using what we call ensemble predictions. So we not only, if this is a forecast time on the x-axis, and you start from some initial condition and some uncertainty of the initial conditions, you're not only performing one, model forecast, but you're actually performing something like 50 model forecasts and you have 50 different blue lines in this in this plot here. And then um, what you end up with is not only like a single prediction of the most likely scenario of, of temperature, for example, over Reading, but actually you get a probability distribution of this prediction. And this helps quite a lot because it's, for example, not only important to know um, where the tropical cyclone is most likely going to hit the coastline, but it's maybe even more important to know the probability that the cyclone is going to hit, for example, a city like Boston. So probability distributions are very important for weather predictions and also for climate predictions. And you can do this with ensembles, but the problem is that the ensembles are very expensive. <clears throat> so the question is now, can you actually reduce the number of ensemble members in your prediction and then just use a smaller number plus a network correction to kind of get the best possible representation of this probability distribution? And that's what we've done. So we've taken a forecast that had 10 or so members in principle, and then we just used five of those and did a neural network post-processing to kind of correct for um, the degradation of the representation of the probability distribution in the end. And now we're using a very complex machine learning tool already, the so-called UNET, and we're also um, using three-dimensional fields of the atmosphere. And then um, the question is whether the ensembles that we get then are actually better than the ensembles that we get um, from, from, from 10 member ensemble. And on the right, um, you see a plot what we call um, CRPS. It's a continuous rank probability score, which is basically um, a measure of how good your ensemble prediction is. And if you just take the 10 ensemble member forecast, you get the, the red bar down on the, on the very right. And the lower, the better in this case, <clears throat> and you get some results. And if you have just five ensemble members, you have this red bar here, and you see that the CRPS is higher, so the ensemble is not as good because it has less members. But if you now take the neural network post-processing um, on top of the five or some members, you actually get the green and the blue bars here. And you see that they are not only lower than the five member ensemble, but they're actually also lower than the 10 member ensemble, at least some of them. And that was possible by not only correcting for the probability distribution, but also correcting for the bias um, of the predictions that you would expect. So we get actually better results um, using neural networks in this case. And this is really interesting and should be investigated further in the future. And also, um, you can do funny things that are a little bit closer to the, um, the cat and dog detection thing um, that you typically know from image rec recognition. For example, you can try to predict um, where the lo locations of tropical cyclones. So imagine you have a 100-year climate simulation and you want to know where the tropical cyclones are. Then you can use um, machine learning tools to actually detect those tropical cyclones. And this is work by Antonino and Thiago at ISNWF in collaboration with a couple of guys um, from NOAA and NVIDIA. And they get also quite nice results in terms of the classification of those um, tropical cyclones. Okay, um, just one slide on the challenges that we have for machine learning. So it's not all uh, nice and, and bloomy. Um, there are also some significant challenges. One of them is um, that often you have a very different philosophy between domain scientists and machine learning scientists. So domain scientists like physical understanding, physical equations, and machine learning scientists like data science problem with inputs, outputs, loss function, and some sort of optimization technique. And sometimes it's not really easy to communicate between those two domains. And it's really important to get um, 
well the the, the communication going. So what we basically want to, to achieve is to support um, close collaborations between machine learning scientists and domain scientists, and also to explore things that we call explainable AI or trustworthy AI or physics informed machine learning, where you basically try to project knowledge about the system into your machine learning solution, or you try to understand um, more what the black box is doing and shed a little bit light into the black box to understand whether it's actually representing the physics in the right way. Then for many application areas off the shelf, machine learning tools will not be sufficient. And this basically calls for us looking into um, cross dissimilar co collaborations that we really learn how to use machine learning properly in the weather and climate domain, but also that we develop our own customized machine learning so solutions for specific machine learning problems. And, and to this end, um, what we propose to invent what we call benchmark data sets. So here, basically, you take a specific problem of your domain. So in my case, it could, for example, be that I have unstructured grids on the sphere that I'm using for my weather and climate model, and I want to learn how to use machine learning and deep learning tools on those unstructured grids. And um, then I basically isolate the problem and formulate it in, in a specific way, and then I, um, I generate a large data set and put it online that all sorts of people can kind of look at this data set and kind of try to beat my reference uh, solution for it. So other people can actually help me solving my problems if you develop what we call a benchmark data set, which is going to be published and then stay there and people can use it. Um, it's often difficult to learn from observations and improve your models. So um, often the observations and the models are actually quite far away from each other and not very, it's not very easy to compare the two. And to really allow to, to be able to learn from observations, data simulation is going to be the key. And also you can do things like learning boundary conditions from, from observations and so on and so forth. So it is, it's really important that we can bring the two communities closer together in the future. Um, there's going to be the data avalanche. Um, so I told you we have an exponential increase in data and that's a problem. Um, and basically what we try to do here is that we try to anticipate the data needs for machine learning um, scientists to basically generate benchmark data sets, for example, for them, that they can easily get access to kind of meaningful data sets without the need of building their own data sets from very large archives and spending a lot of time. And um, also we want to, we need to make sure that we kind of use data hardware efficiently um, to kind of really make, well, um, get the best well, data product um, out to the user. Um, there's a different set of tools between machine learning scientists and domain scientists. So domain scientists love um, CPUs and Fortran and um, machine learning scientists love Python and GPUs. And this basically means that we need to develop infrastructure um, at centers like ESNWF um, in both in software and hardware, but also in terms of the training. So train staff to actually be able to use machine learning tools who are normally just um, used to, to Fortran and other tools. And finally, also, it's often more difficult than we may think to integrate con machine learning tools into conventional numerical weather predictions um, and climate services tools. Um, so it's really also important to kind of build generalized solutions, uh, centralized solutions for specific things like, for example, call a deep neural network from Fortran and these kind of things. We need to have centralized solution for something like this. Okay, um, we've recently, if you're interested in the challenges, we have recently published what we call the machine learning roadmap. So um, it's available online. Please have a look if you're interested in, in what we think are the challenges um, for the domain. However, the, the, the roadmap is not focusing on scientific developments. It's more focusing on infrastructure and, application, um, and, and needs for the community. But it could be an interesting um, 11 page read if, you, if you're interested in the subject. Um, we also have projects coming up that are interesting um, for machine learning. Um, one, one of them is particularly close to my heart, which is a milestone project because I'm the coordinator of the project. And what we want to do here is we really want to build machine learning applications that scale very well to very large um, high performance computers. So we want to do what we call a co-design cycle, where we develop uh, machine learning solutions in one of the work packages, and then we build software tools in, in another work package. And then finally, we also develop hardware, um, hardware system designs to kind of make the best possible use of um, what is available on the hardware market today for specific applications for machine learning in weather and climate. One of the other interesting question is also whether we can use conventional, um, use deep learning hardware for conventional models. So I told you before that um, um, deep learning has a very strong impact nowadays on um, machine learning hardware, sorry, on, on hardware developments in general. 
And the question is, if you're not interested in machine learning, can you actually use machine learning hardware for a conventional model? And um, the problem here is that the the, the conventional uh, that, that the machine learning hardware is actually um, using a very low numerical precision, and is based on dense linear algebra. So it's very specific, actually. And often we can't really use um, the reduced precision hardware for our our cases, um, because typically we'll be used to to run models in in what we call double precision with 64 bits per variable. But we recently have made a switch from double precision to single precision, where you just reduce the amount of bits that you you use to store values by a factor of two, and by doing this you actually can increase your efficiency quite significantly. So if you had our old system that was running in double precision with 90 um, 91 vertical levels. And you have our new system, which is running in single position and an increased number of vertical levels. We actually get um, your higher, higher resolution in our systems, but we can still reduce the cost from 100% to 87% by using, reducing the numerical position. And we still get better results actually using the single position version with a higher resolution because the higher resolution will gain you something while the single position is not going to reduce the quality. So we get better results by reducing precision because we can reinvest the savings. And the question is now, can we go further? Can we actually do the same with half precision? And that's again something that Sam Hatfield had looked into, who is going to give you the introduction to ESNWF in a minute. Um, so he asked the question whether we can use um, machine learning hardware in, um, for, for conventional tools. And, and the specific hardware he looked into was a so-called Tensor Core by NVIDIA. And this is hardware that allows you to do half precision calculations with only 16 bits per variable. Um, and do matrix matrix multiplications with this at an enormous speed. So the factor, the, the tensor core will be 16 times faster than a normal double position operation um, on the same hardware, 16 times faster. And um, the question is whether it's actually usable at this hardware for our, um, our models. And um, Sam looked into the most expensive kernel of the system that we have, which is in this, what we call the transform. Um, so this is basically a mapping procedure between grid point space and spectral space. And this can form more than half um, of the cost of our high resolution simulations for the atmosphere and um, for the very, very high resolution model simulations. And um, this transform actually consists mainly of what we call the Legendre transformation. And that's basically nothing else than a matrix matrix multiplication. So potentially it could probably be done um, with those um, tender cut chips. The question is whether you can actually reduce precision to a level of 16 bits per numbers um, to do this. And it turns out that Sam was able to do this by um, basically rescaling the input and output fields, fields of the ensemble uh, of the Legendre transformation. And to make a long and in short, you can actually do this. So Sam finds that you can really reduce precision um, without getting significant errors, um, but you can assume that you're going to kind of get a significant increase in, um, in the speed for your simulations. So um, in principle, there's no reason not to at least investigate how to use um, machine learning hardware for your conventional modeling application. Okay, so um, these are the conclusions and um, they are, I kept them very general, so I leave them for you to read and I'm happy to take questions if I found a good internet connection um, somewhere in Croatia. So let's hope for the best and let's hope that you will see me in a minute virtually but live. Thank you. <laughs>